Welcome to this Houdini notebook tutorial. This video is part of the terrain notebook. And in this video, we're looking at the height field shallow water solver. All right, so this node is a bit of an interesting one, mostly because it doesn't work as many of the other height field tools do, in that it actually generates something dynamic for us. It does a simulation that we can play back. So I'm going to show you how to work with a single piece of terrain, how to turn an area into water, and then solve it using the shallow water solver. So if we go over here and just use a mask by feature, and this is going to be the height field mask by feature, we can just plug this in over here. Now, this is going to be the area that we want to define our water area to be. So we don't want to mask by slope, we just want to do it by height, compute the range, and then what we can do is just remove those endpoints and invert the curve. This is going to give us all of these low-lying areas, and this is going to be good for a water level. So we then use a copy layer, and the copy layer over here can be useful for converting our mask to a layer called water. This water layer is what gets used by the shallow water solver. So if we type hf shallow water and plug it in over here, you'll see that it actually lifts that up very slightly, right? So it takes our water level and adds water to it. So it adds height to it. And this just allows us to treat it as if it were a water which has depth. So if we now play this back, we'll already have a simulation that runs. And if it's difficult to see, what we can do is we can clear our mask. So we can do a mask clear, height field mask clear over here. And over on this actual shallow water, we can go over to output and set this to color by water layer. Now this is going to give us a better idea of what's going on. So we play this back and it's very difficult to see the kind of movement that we're getting. It's extremely subtle at this point, and that's simply because this is treating it as very shallow water. An interesting thing that I've found to actually work with this is multiplying our water layer. By multiplying our water layer, it actually gives this more water to work with. But before we go and do that, let's take a look at some of our options. So over here, we have the input water height is absolute. All this is going to do is make sure that our water height, all this is going to do is make sure that our water height is zero or more. Right, so it's going to bring all of our water level up to the zero axis. Alternatively, you can also avoid this where it lifts up the water level by saying input terrain includes the water height. And so that way it won't actually lift the water to this level for simulation. Over here we have gravity, and that is exactly what you'd think it is. Over here we have a velocity diffusion. Velocity diffusion just smooths out velocities and gives you a simulation that looks more viscous and smoothed out. For regular water like we have, we're not going to use the velocity diffusion. Time scale over here is just how quickly this plays back. So if we were to set this to three, then this will play back at three times the usual rate. This is generally going to be adjusted depending on the scale of your scene, because sometimes you want water that looks like it's moving a lot faster because it's at a smaller scale or slower because it's at a larger scale. Over here, we have a damping layer. If we enable this, then anything around the edges of our height field are going to be dampened. What this means is that when waves approach the edge of our domain, they're going to get smoothed out. And we also have a damp water depth, and you can see that it dampens the edges over there in terms of depth as well. So these two options aren't going to be useful in our case, but if you want water that just kind of smooths off towards the edges and doesn't bounce back into the simulation, that's how you're going to achieve that. As for constraint updates, we'll look at this shortly. But this is basically just for introducing other sorts of sourcing. So we can introduce other sources of fluid or things that can sink our volume, or in other words, remove fluid. And then we can also add forces. Now we have some speed limits down here, and that does become useful if your waves are behaving in ways that you wouldn't like them to. Sometimes they might gather in very aggressive ways, and you can then adjust your speed limits to ensure that they don't misbehave. Okay, so now that we have the basics covered, let's go ahead and actually change the water source to give us something more interesting. Now, if we were to firstly try input water height is absolute, you'll actually see that we get some really good looking ripples. And that's actually because our water level has been raised up so much, right? As our water level gets pushed up to this extremely high value, we end up with a higher depth so it can move around in more interesting ways. An alternative to doing this is just multiplying our water level. We can do this with a volume wrangle, plug it in after the height field copy layer. And if we go over here and just say at water times equals some amount, let's just say five, then when we go to the shallow water solver, you'll actually see that our water level has been raised, right? It's been lifted up to a point higher than our terrain. And this is actually kind of what we want. So when we do it like this and we play it back, you'll see that we end up with much more interesting results, right? Our water is kind of rippling and it's pushing up over here, 
and then receding back. You'll see how this water will push up over here and then it should recede back out, right? So these work a lot more like shorelines. Now, of course, these values might be a bit too extreme. And also you're going to have to change your visualization to get a better idea of this. This over here under your output where you have your visualized range, this is going to be the max water amount. So if we change this to five, you'll get a better idea of what's going on, right? So we play this back. And this is the sort of movement that we're getting. Now, this is okay, but it's not really reminiscent of what water would actually do. So what we're going to do over here is go over to our wave limits over here. We're going to increase our wave speed to two and our max surface speed to something like four. You can go a bit higher with that, but these values seem to work pretty okay. And it'll generally just smooth out the movement a bit, right? So this is already a bit more believable, but if we wanted this to be, say, perhaps a shoreline, where we have water coming in from, let's just say the right side, then how would we do that? This is where we want to start sourcing. So when we source fluid, it's going to be adding fluid to our simulation. And I can show you exactly how this works if we just mask an area over here. So after we've done this copy layer and that, what we can do is we can clear our mask. And so all we have is our water layer being saved. So we still have our water layer, but we're just clearing our mask so that we can do a new mask. And we're going to do this with a height field paint, right? This over here is going to allow us to just paint in an area for sourcing. So I'm going to just click and drag over here. This is going to be the area that sources in water. And then once again, we're going to use a copy layer. So a copy layer over here, go from mask to source. And we know that the name that it's looking for is source because on this shallow water solver, if you go over to the bindings, you'll see that the source layer is source. So I'm just going to disable these over here. And then on our height field paint, we're just going to recache the strokes. And then we can play this back over here. And we can see that it is very slightly sourcing in some water, right? You can see that the water spreads through over time and it's using the source as the origin for all of this water. So if we were to push this up, we could do that. Under the source scale over here, we can increase this to something like 10. You'll see that it inputs a lot more of this fluid into our simulation, right? So this is much more water than we had before. So we can settle for a much lower value, something like two, but generally we wouldn't want it to be so uniform, right? We don't want the sourcing to be so uniform all the time. So what we can do is over here on our height field paint, just after it, we can use a height field mask noise. So let's just go height field mask noise, just like this. And you'll see that it adds a noise everywhere. We want it to be multiplied. So only the area that has a mask already will be affected. Then we can decrease the element size to something like that. Go down to post-processing and just push up the gain to a value of one, right? So if we have something like this, then all we have to do is go to our offset and do something like $t multiplied by three. Right. Now, all that's going to do is over time, this is going to animate, right? So you can see that our source is now animating over time. This is going to give us a much better result because we're no longer going to have this single strip that's going to be adding fluid into our simulation. So you can see that it already looks better. But if you play this back, you'll see that this doesn't actually change over time. And that's because we also need to change one thing on here. And that is the source frequency. Over here, we can say once per frame or once every substep. We'll just do once per frame. And all it's going to do is every frame, it's going to check our sourcing and then add it, right? So it's going to update our source and now it'll change over time. So as you can see, this is going to give us something that resembles waves. And so of course, when we reintroduce our water, this is going to look a lot better. So over here on our height field paint, just recache the strokes. I'm going to reduce our water level slightly. And every time we make a change, we will have to recache the strokes, change our output now to this and you'll see that we don't see much of our sourcing. So we're just going to increase the amount that's being added until we can see it. So that looks good. Now you'll see that we have these wave type things being pushed into the rest of our simulation, right? So we're constantly going to be emitting a sort of wave from the right side over here where our sourcing is occurring. And on our height field, we can decrease the grid spacing so that we have a higher resolution simulation. Once again, recaching our strokes. And if we play this back, we'll have a decent looking result. Now, one thing to note is that this isn't really a fluid simulation. This is just affecting the height field. So this is only going to be useful for fairly low fidelity shots. Perhaps you have something that's at a distance and you just need water that appears to be lapping up against the surface. Then that's a perfectly fine use case for this over here. But really, you don't want to be using this for a high resolution simulation or anything like that. 
What you could do is you could take this and you could isolate just the area that is considered water. And then you could cut that out using a bunch of these height field operations and then use that as a transmissive layer and you'll have a water layer. The only other little bonus thing that I wanna show you which might help this look is if we were to add some sort of waves to this. So if you wanted to add a force to this, you have to firstly go over to the bindings and add a force mask layer. This is where the force can be applied. And in your setup, you just have to enable the forces frequency and you'll probably want to use it every frame. An example of this is if we were to use an ocean spectrum, we plug this into an ocean evaluate into the second input and this ocean evaluate, we can preview the grid. So that's what the water will look like, right? It'll just move like that. Then that's not actually what we want. We go over to volumes and over here, we enable velocity. We match it to the size of our incoming height field. So this one over here is 80 by 80. So we'll go over here and make this 80 by 80. And then we just need to make sure that it matches this over here. So what we can do is we can merge it in over here. We'll merge it just before our simulation. And all we're going to do is now move that down so that it's overlapping our water layer. So that box that is now outlining this, we're gonna move it down. And I'm also going to disable my preview grid so that it's not too distracting. We just move this down right over there. Right, so now it is overlapping that area of our simulation. So this over here will now generate velocity, velocity x, y, and z, and those are all volumes, so that's perfectly fine. You may also just want to increase the uniform sampling divisions to something like 200, just for a higher resolution velocity. Then if we go over here, you'll see that we do have a slight deformation occurring, but the problem is that it's not going to be updated every frame. So to update it every frame, we just have to go over here to our forces frequency, say once per frame. And again, that doesn't work quite yet because this forces field doesn't actually know what it should look at. And an easy way that I found to tell it what to use, you can either just use the water layer or you can just use vel dot asterisk. So wherever there's velocity, just apply it to our simulation. So we play this back now and you'll see that it adds this velocity to our simulation. And of course that looks a bit weird, but you can tweak the settings until it gives you something that looks like waves. So we can point it more in this direction. So I'm just gonna preview it over here and then change the direction. There we go. So this is the same as minus 90. So minus 90 is the direction that we want. And then if you don't want it to affect your simulation as much as it currently is, you can just adjust the amplitude down to something like two, merge that in, Hide this preview grid, play this back. And this is how you'll end up with more wave-like structures. Of course, adjusting these settings until you're happy with what you have. But this is the general idea of how I would go about doing this. Now, there's a lot of other creative ways that you can use this node, and I would recommend taking a look into this. Um, there's a lot of fun things you can do. And the other thing is that it generates all of these fields for us. If we go over to the output, we have an output velocity, acceleration, and vorticity. And when you start playing with those settings in conjunction to what we have, then you end up with some really interesting results, right? You can use this velocity field to trail particles and end up with all sorts of crazy looking effects. So with some slightly tweaked settings, this is the kind of look that we end up with. So I do hope that this helped you understand this node. It is a bit of a weird one, I will admit, but it's a lot of fun and there's loads of cool things that you can do with it. So I do hope that you take the time to look into it. That is all for this part though, and I'll be seeing you with the next video. So I'll be seeing you then. Bye.